David will be chasing the cat all over the house. This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. This episode is sponsored by Codeship.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's Codeship. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically for fuss-free continuous delivery. Check them out at Codeship.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues Podcast. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 169 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have David Brady. Who has mute button problems. James Edward Gray. Does episode 169 mean that we have 169 guests today? Just about. Avdi Grimm. Hello from Pennsylvania. Saran Yitbarak. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and we have a few special guests this week. We have Postmodern. I have not seen the movie The Broom, nor will I probably in the near future, but I can quote 50% of it, mostly from YouTube channel videos and memes. We have Mislav Maronic. Hello from BC, Canada. And we have Michael Poppies. Hello from Poland. So we're kind of talking about the... Wait, re- I want to hear Postmodern quote 50% of the movie The Broom. I'm waiting. I mean, it's The Room, but... uh, or Room, sorry. See, the there's... Room. Lisa, you're tearing me apart. Um, oh, hi, oh, hey, Mike. Post- yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, postmodern. <laughs> <laughs> nice doggy. Awesome. Okay, sorry. You may continue. <laughs> Thanks. Glad I got permission. <laughs> so we brought on all these guests because there are different options for managing your Ruby versions. Uh, there's RVM, Truby. And I should have done my homework because I don't remember the other one that we're representing. RBM. RBM. That's right. So we know which guest now feels like he's further down on the totem pole. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of feel like we need to show some extra courtesy here. (laughs) Yeah. There's also compiling by hand. That's true. And and that guest was not invited today. (laughs) There is actually a person in uh, the the Ruby IRC channel, Freenode, who always advocates compiling by hands. It's oh, not really? Roger Pack, is it? Uh, it's uh, Chevy. I believe that's his handle. Uh, and then I Ford jumps all over him. I always advocate running the uh, the compiler individually on each file rather than this sort of, you know... Make in, file in, stuff. Make files, you know, Save your sort of industrialized way. making. Who knows what they're really doing? Yeah, no yeah. kidding. I try to grass feed my files. Yeah, that's after you compile Linux, Linux from scratch. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously. <laughs> and you compile your compiler. Well, I mean, so well, welcome. It's gonna bootstrap it. So welcome to today's episode on how to mismanage your Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I think is interesting is that when I got started in Ruby, 
eons and eons ago. It seemed like everybody was basically on version 186 or 187, and you just upgraded, and it wasn't a big deal. It really didn't become an issue until we started getting different distributions. Like, boy, now I can't even think of those. We have JRuby, and we have Rubinius. Rubinius, Maglev, MacRuby, Topaz, few, few of them. And then well, on and top also, of that, we, we got into the different versions, 193, one, you know, 191, 192, 193, 2.0. And also patches like Enterprise, Ruby, Ruby, whatever it's called. And also the, was it the Falcon patches, the performance patches? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And REE, mm-hmm. Ruby Enterprise Edition. And I remember, I remember kind of the first foray into this was RVM and Wayne Seguin wrote it and, basically supported it on his own. I thought he was kind of crazy all the time he was putting it on it. And it's interesting how this has all evolved into this ecosystem now. Do you guys want to briefly introduce the solution that you're here to talk about and why its approach is different or, you know, what scenarios it best fits? Well, can, can we back up before we yeah. do that? Can we just can somebody talk really briefly about what is the sort of broad problem these tools solve? It's a great idea. I just want to mention something that wasn't mentioned historically is that kind of the the other reason for these tools is we've historically had problems with our environments and these tools kind of have met the needs of, for instance, installing additional libraries, uh, working around weird platform specific bugs. I mean, RVM is, uh, you know, that was kind of one of the main things that uh, Wayne originally mentioned was he needed to install some, you know, bleeding edge version at the time on CentOS, which is really, you know, kind of impossible. That's true, especially if you were consulting or switching from one project to another where the requirements were just a little different. Right. Oh yeah. Is, yeah, is it fair to say that this is that this is ba- that these tools all basically address a developer problem? Like if I wanted to just distribute a command line application to a bunch of machines to non-developers, I would probably just write it to the the Ruby 192 API, and that's what you can find on Ubuntu, and that's what you can find on Max, and I wouldn't worry about any of this. Or even just package Ruby itself and just make a giant right. binary package. Mm-hmm. But this is, this, is it fair to say this is, this is about the problem of being a developer in Ruby and needing to switch back and forth between different versions for different applications, or even try one application on many versions? We have few problems. There is the one problem of switching, which every of these tools uh, solves. And the other problem is uh, you need to get a version. And Ruby is moving quite fast, and none of the distributions uh, is able to catch up with Ruby. So every time you want to install Ruby and you think of the package manager, you get very old version. That's very so true. That's maybe not point. old, but yeah, but not very, but it's old. So talking about something like app get on Debian, I assume we say that whatever version you grab there may be a little bit behind the curve. And OS X right. has traditionally been quite behind the curve in its distributions, although Mavericks did pretty good catching up. The, what does it ship with? Good question. I'll check. <laughs> so one thing that that's interesting about that is that a lot of these versions or uh, yeah, a lot of these versions of Linux they start working on them a year or two in advance, and so they just lock in whatever the current version is then, and so by the time they release, that's why they're out of date. They built also, the packages way back in the day. Um, also, it's because you're probably using a long-term supported version, the LTS version mm-hmm. of like Ubuntu on EC2, and so that's kind of the version of Linux that people know most, and that's kind of just like, oh, they're always behind. But, you know, of course, if you're using something like uh, Fedora, Gentoo, Arch, any of the other distros that are always trying to keep up to date, or OpenSUSE, I think, is another one. Uh, they do a pretty decent job, at least staying up to date with like the most stable version. So you're not going to get like you know two the latest version that was released yesterday, but you're going to get one that was released probably within the year, and you know it's it's guaranteed to work. That's true. Maverick ships with 2.0.0 patch 4.51. It is obviously two minor versions behind now, but I think, um, I believe it was actually current when Maverick ships are really close to it. And it's also worth considering that the packagers for a given like Linux distribution, they face a very different problem than we do as developers because they have packages that depend on those Ruby packages. You know, they have Ruby applications that are packaged that then depend on those those Ruby VMs. And so they have to ensure that they don't break those dependencies that they're also shipping. 
So it's a different kind of problem entirely. Right. Thus, you know, the big split when one nine hit and was pretty drastically different in a lot of ways. A lot of package managers kind of split that into a separate version. Right. On the systems like Ubuntu, if you install the Ruby package, that would be not even close to having a working development environment for developing something with Rails. You would have to install at least five or six optional packages. I remember that from the times I was working on Ubuntu as well. So right. using a version manager, Ruby version manager to install Ruby would ensure that you have actually a complete development environment rather than having something that's only good for maybe running command line scripts, but not being able to parse YAML or make an HTTPS request, things like that. It's similar to like installing Java. You know, you can install a JRE or you can install a J a JDK if you're a developer. Uh, there is the Ruby full package, which I think uh, installs most everything, but that's because, you know, Debian has this history of splitting everything into little teeny packages. I mean, they were doing micro packages before it was cool. There's been a lot of debates on the value of that, and we probably don't need to get into it here, but it's kind of weird because then you can't rely on parts of the standard library, which is a little strange. So, so I guess the point is, as developers, we need more recent versions, we need multiple versions, we need to be able to switch back and forth easily, and we need to be able to install them easily. I think and have them good. coexist. Right, but there's, there's also the, kind of the other aspect where people kind of use tools like RVM or RBF in production, because they, they feel that they need um, the most recent version in production, and their system package manager doesn't provide it, or they don't have packages available, and so it, the developer mindset sort of bleeds into production as we kind of see them as like similar environments. It's always yeah. nice to be developing on the same thing that's in, in production. Yeah, I have to admit, I generally just compile Ruby on my uh, server and then just target whatever version I compiled on there. And then I just update it periodically when I feel like I need to. I've seen the reverse as well, where a sysadmin will use like RVM to lock Ruby to a known good version and just let it kind of get older and older, even if the system Ruby updates. So it's just another use case, though, of right of, of production wants to control their version as well. There is another problem of controlled migrations. When you install just one version in a slash user directory, then you have no option to go back if you upgrade. You would have to install the new Ruby, and as much as it's easy, if you use one server, that's problematic. You should use separate directory to be sure you can get back to your working version. Yeah, you can you can downgrade packages, but yeah, technically most of the distros what they do is they separate them into version families, and so you have these awkwardly uh, you know suffixed uh, Ruby executables uh, based on the version family. Yeah, you can install multiple directories, and there's ways about doing that. We can, like, I'm guessing later in the podcast, we'll talk about Unix file system hierarchy. I would generally not recommend using any of the RVM and RBN in production because eventually every mature production environment ends up being managed by scripts like Puppet or Chef and having a compiled version of Ruby with patches for performance and garbage collection. So this convenience of easy install and switching, while it's great for development, it's not a convenience I think sysadmins need for setting up production environments. But the convenience they need is to be able to compile and lock down a project to a single version of Ruby that's optimized for running this application. And that might not be the canonical version of Ruby or yeah. the one that is just straight up installed by saying RVM install this or RVM install that. But a lot of people don't really mind having this managers in production. So I see a lot of people uh, managing their production environments with either RVM or RBM. And this is going to be one thing. This is going to be hard to talk about the podcast is RVM and RBM are really (laughs) similar to pronounce. I've never, uh, I don't usually talk about this stuff out loud. So right now that I do in this podcast, it's really interesting that um, (laughs) to to hear that there's basically no difference. And but what I was saying about production environments, yeah, I had a, uh, we get a lot of requests, support requests for people who are trying to set up their production environment that they're really struggling with RBM and setting up path. And I usually tell them, you know, if you don't know how to set it up, maybe you shouldn't be setting it up 
because if it's too complex for your environment, then, you know, better not do it because if you end up with an environment that you not, don't understand how it works, that is not a very good place to deploy your, you know, production code on to. Right, because all these tools, they all depend on being configured and having a certain environments. And in production, a lot of the times, the shells are not going to be, they're not going to load up these configurations. They're going to run under different users. You're going to run under empty environments. And these tools kind of add an extra layer that your scripts have to be cognizant of to make sure to load or whatever, or run under the correct shell if it's, you know, interactive login shell, something like that. And yeah, it really is unnecessary for production. Because I feel like a lot of people have gotten sucked into using these tools over the years and they kind of forgot that, well, yes, you have a development environment, but production environment requires a certain level of administration and a certain amount of like systems engineering where you actually kind of like craft the environments. And sometimes that might uh, require compiling uh, source code and making a package, configuring files. And we kind of got sucked into using all these automated tools and to use RVM or RBM and CHRuby with these tools, we just require, it requires more modules and more plugins and such. It's worth noting, too, that the packaged versions of more recent Rubies or patched Rubies have started showing up that like uh, you can find PPAs, Ubuntu PPAs for very recent ver- versions of Ruby, like Brightbox has uh, a PPA for that, uh, that you can just have your server source from there. Right, and that's, like, that's definitely, I think, the way forward creating specific packages and, you know, making sure that they're trusted. Yep. So okay. I, I do want to get into the nitty gritty of running my development environment. And just to kind of set the stage, I've been using RVM for a long time and I really haven't felt enough pain to switch. Does that make sense? So I'm curious as to, you know, what the advantages or disadvantages are of, of these systems and why I should pick one over the other, depending on how I work. Maybe we could just go around the horn and each maintainer could mention, you know, what they think are the, is the main focus of. Yeah, like what's your philosophy of. Yeah. RVM was started on servers. So it wasn't tool for developers on the start. And it has a lot of stuff that helps you work with your server. Like when you have a problem with uh, setting your environment for cron for service services, uh, for every, Ruby, you install, you get an environment file which automatically loads proper configuration for that Ruby and it also generates wrappers. This way you can say uh, in cron, use this wrapper, the, the direct path, and it will automatically load your Ruby, a uh, proper configuration for Ruby and the proper application you want to run, the gem you, you are running. As for development, just for development, RVM it's not really a feature that was from beginning, but RVM has this uh, auto-libs feature that automatically, depending on your system, on your versions, configuration, detects your dependencies and installs only what is needed. So like you have uh, GCC, uh, so some version of GCC installed in OS X, then you don't need to install Another version, like uh, so it's not hard-coded, install the newest version. If there is some older version, it's used. So there is a lot of code that detects what's already available. And if it's possible, don't install anything else. So I guess that's one of the biggest things for RVM. RVM had, had also sometimes issues. And because RVM is uh, really, really big and used by many users, and there will be people that had problems and as long the problem was not reported, it could go unseen because I didn't have the problem. Maybe any other contributor didn't have the problem. And some people might say, okay, there is a problem. I will stop using it. It's just, I think it's a question of reporting it. RBN, as opposed to RBM, was imagined in a way that it would be following the Unix philosophy, um, relying on executables that were in your path and less, almost non hooking into a person's shell to intercept calls to commands like Ruby, Rake, a Bundler, or others. And to do that, RBN operates in a way that it creates 
uh, shim executables uh, and a special directory that's added to the path that intercept these calls to any of these commands that you might have the, that you might be using in development and from there on it figures out what the current version of the ruby should be for this directory primarily looking at the that ruby dash version file like other ruby managers do as well and it dynamically switches the call to this specified Ruby version. So I guess it look, sounds a little bit complicated when I'm talking about it. So I would just summarize what the most important difference are and what the trade-offs are. The trade-off is that RBN will be slower and will require setup of your path in your environment in different tools that you use. So in an act, interactive shell, obviously to change path, but if you're working Ruby from other programs, you will need to edit path in those as well, like desktop applications. And uh, so for instance, text made or editors like that. And the trade-off is that it's less dependent on an interactive shell, meaning that it can run in an environment where there's no interactive shell without any problems. But on the other hand, it resolves the current Ruby version on each call to each Ruby executable, which means that uh, on everything that you start on a command line, there's a overhead of picking the Ruby version and switching to that. So then it's a tad slower. People don't seem to mind this. So it's not a huge obstacle for people when picking Ruby version managers. And for me, it was more appealing before I was made maintainer to use RBN because I found it simpler and I found it more reassuring that I could just use bash executables and not having any shell integration that I would have to debug while figuring out why the correct Ruby version wasn't used because shell scripts, shell integration in, in an interactive shell are usually a little bit tricky to debug because there's not a lot of tools to, or at least the, the, I didn't know enough to debug my the current environment of what's happening in all these shell scripts that will be sourced by other programs and other Ruby version managers. So yeah, following the Unix philosophy and also different from RVM, something that we I think we didn't mention yet, well, comparing these three projects, what... A fundamental difference between them are is that neither RBN or CH Ruby they don't handle actual installing of Ruby versions by themselves. So by themselves they're only switchers, and the actual installing is done by means of separate projects. For RBN, this project is called Ruby Dash Build, and for CH Ruby it's called uh, Ruby, Ruby install. Dash, Ruby Dash install, right? Yeah. yeah. So typically users of RBN, they also install the Ruby dash build and typically users of CH Ruby, as I think they typically install Ruby dash install projects. So these projects go in tandem, but they're developed separately. They're released separately. And this is both a positive and a negative thing. Positive is that they can be released separately. They track each other's issues. They are, they solve separate problems. So there is this separation of concerns and responsibility. And as developers, we like this. Users, though, they often get confused where's the boundary between these projects. So especially for RBN, they report bugs about compilation of Ruby in the RBN projects because they think they're just using one project. And that's completely understandable. I would think so as well. I mean, like when using software, you're not aware of its internals. But on the other hand, I, like as a maintainer, I appreciate that these concerns are separate. And I also appreciate that I can choose to not use Ruby dash build or I can use any alternative project or even like chef scripts, even in my development environment to install Ruby. So I can use a combination of Ruby version switcher with another style of installing the Ruby version. So another style of compiling Ruby versions on my system. And that will be yeah, the short overview of RBN. All right. So I think I'll go next here. So CH Ruby or yeah, that's what I'd like to call it pretty much. Uh, you know, you can pronounce it however 
But yeah, it's uh, patterned after the concept of creating very small and very simple Unix utilities. And it's a path-based switcher, so it modifies the path environment variable primarily to provide access to the bin directory of your Ruby. And it also adds some additional paths to the path variable, for instance, for Ruby gems. So you have access to all the Ruby gems of that Ruby. Um, let's see, and going through the and, features. And by, that, yeah. by that, do you mean the binary directory? Like the, yes. The directory, well, not binary, but the directory of, exec, of Ruby gems executables? Yes, and uh, okay. I'll go more into that. Um, but anyway, so CHRuby, its philosophy is it's minimalist. A lot of people kind of like throw around the word simplicity and complexity. I think minimalism uh, from the art term is, makes a lot of sense here. Uh, it's minimalist in functionality and also size. Uh, the it's split into majorly two files. So like you have, you can choose to load one of the two files. Oh, I should also point out that a lot of these, uh, like for instance, um, RVM and some of the other switchers and managers, they use this weird trick. I think also RVM does it as well where the actual majority of logic is in another bash script and they load in a minimal amount of shell script that basically just calls out to that bash script for certain needs and then evals the output of the script into the shell. And I kind of felt that that was a little bit too, kind of a little too much misdirection. And so CHRuby literally just source it into your shell configuration. So it loads directly in and can modify environment variables as it pleases because it's basically just shell functions. But the main file, chruby.sh, is 99 lines of code. And then the other file, auto.sh, which handles auto-loading, so you can choose not to load that if you don't want it, for instance, in a server environment, uh, is 31 lines of code. Uh, it runs on Bash and ZHS, supports those. It's heavily unit tested. That was kind of one of the main things that a lot of people typically choose not to do when they're getting to Bash because they think, you know, they feel it's, oh, it's just so simple. You don't need to write tests. What could go wrong? But yeah, so it modifies a couple of environment variables, primarily path. Uh, it also detects the correct gem directories and adds those as well to path, the bin directories of the Ruby gems. Uh, as of course, uh, Ruby gems is since, was it 191? I mean, or 190 technically has been embedded into Ruby. So there's like actually two technical gem directories, the one that's actually built into Ruby that ships with certain uh, default gems. And then there's the user directory in your home directory, .gem. And it also sets uh, gem home and gem path, which are used to look up uh, gem directories. And it sets gem home for regular users uh, to your gem directory because a lot of people prefer to install gems without sudo. And it also compartmentalizes it for version. So you can have your 1.8 gems separate from your 1.9 gems and so on. And also, you know, your JRuby gems separate from your MRI gems. And see, it also detects the Ruby engine, the Ruby version, and some other environment variables, and it exports those. It's very simple, and it also supports fuzzy matching. It also doesn't care where your Rubies are installed. You can basically just add the paths to uh, the Ruby's environment variable, and it will use that. It defaults to using the system Ruby because I kind of feel that that should be the de facto go-to Ruby. If it's broken, you should probably, you know, file a bug with your distro or OS vendor and get it fixed or get it updated. Uh, yeah, it also supports auto-switching, like I mentioned, which auto-detects uh, ruby version files. Uh, which I think we now, we, most all switchers have standardized on, which basically just contains a string, and that is kind of dependent on the, how the switcher ha- wants to handle that. Again, CHRuby supports fuzzy uh, matching, so you can literally just put 1.9 in there, or 2.0, or JRuby, or whatever, and it'll just attempt to match it against the names of the rubies that it knows. And auto-switching is actually pretty fast. Uh, we were kind of worried initially that there would be some sort of performance uh, degradations because we had to you know, resort to some clever tricks because, uh, as it turns out, uh, not all shells are so nice. Um, on Z8S, uh, it uses pre-exec functions, which is a set of hooks you can add that will run before every command. And we basically just have a simple command that scans the directories for I mean dot Ruby version file, and if it detects it, it'll set some environment variables, so it doesn't have to redetect it every time you run a command. And it can detect that oh, we're already using that version file. We've already switched to that Ruby. We don't need to do it again. Bash uses trap debug, which is another uh, kind of hook for running before every command. Yeah, and so that works out pretty well. That was kind of one of the main things that was requested by people. They really wanted that auto-switching that they'd grown used to from RVM, so we kind of eventually hashed out kind of the how the behavior and how it should work. 
I was actually very hesitant to add it. Kind of the philosophy, keeping with the minimalist philosophy, is you know, do we really need these features, or have we just grown used to using them? For instance, using a Ruby, you know, manager switcher in production. That's kind of the thing. Like, I feel we don't really need this. Another thing we've actually been really he- hesitant on adding is gem sets. Um, I actually am working on a separate script that you load in that would allow provide like um, lots of functionality and features for uh, managing and manipulating your uh, gem path, which I think is a, a lot better, you know, solution than having these gem sets that are rooted in your dot gem file in your home directory. I'd kind of like to talk about some of these features. Yeah, I would too. Especially, how about gem sets, since they were just brought up. I'll explain what I know about them, and feel free to correct me. But So I, I believe the feature came from RVM, Ruby Version Manager. where R- Rhythm. Rhythm, yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> I think that it had the initial feature of gem sets, and the idea there was you can use all of these to switch Ruby. So you can say, I want to use Ruby 1.9, or I want to use Ruby 2, or whatever. But in RVM, you can say, I want to use Ruby 2.0 with gem set my crazy project. And the idea then is you get basically a clean set of gems that only has the gems from that particular project. And so when this came out, it was almost needed because it was a lifesaver. Yeah. Because at the time, resolving dependencies in Ruby was unbelievable. It was horrible. You'd pull down some Rails application and then, you know, spend a day trying to get it to run because it needed this exact set of certain gems and if you had another one in there that was of a newer version or whatever it would grab that one instead which then would miss some dependency of some other thing and and chaos ensued but you get these compartmentalized gem repositories kind of that just apply to specific projects or specific use cases or whatever the downside of something like that is then you end up with like lots of duplication like you may have a specific gem installed multiple times i assume maybe i don't have that right but we'll see and then in my opinion when we got bundler and particularly when bundler became pretty usable and universal bundler solves that problem in that uh, when Bundler loads, it will, you know, resolve the dependencies and make sure that it locks to the right gems, no matter what gems are installed on the system. So even though there may be a newer one, it will make sure that gem does not get loaded and you get the version that you need to satisfy all the dependencies. So my opinion is that with Bundler, I don't feel that need for gem sets anymore. So now I find that they kind of annoy me that they provide that other layer (laughs) of managing something that I don't want to be there anymore because Bundler is taking care of that and I don't have to worry about that anymore. Can I pile on that just real quick? Because the only thing that's worse than having a gem set set up for a project anymore, in my opinion, is having it automatically set in your Ruby dash version or RVMRC or whatever, because then it totally switches you to a completely different context And with most of these tools, when you auto, you know, you go into a directory and it changes, automatically changes your Ruby version for you, it doesn't change it back when you leave. And so I've been in a situation where I temporarily moved over to another part of a project that had its own gem set and then moved back to another project that didn't have that set. And it totally messed things up. And I'm wound up installing gems into the gem set that I didn't need because I was in a different project and had it all act weird. And so, yeah, I relying on Bundler actually saves me pain as opposed to using gem sets. Don't forget the fast CPUs because the problem when we needed uh, gem sets was uh, many years ago and our processors were like four or even eight times slower I don't know, maybe 16. Uh-huh. We, we can get the number, but right at the beginning, it would take a lot of time to resolve the gem dependencies. And right now we have uh, really fast CPUs that can do that resolving a lot faster. I think it's yeah, been that- optimized a bit as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Def- the, the Ruby Gems developers have done a good job of uh, optimizing the version picking strategy. That's That was a, a major pain point in the past where 
I was developing on very really large projects and trying to run some sort of executable from them and installed in kind of like my main set of gems. It's like, wow, why is it taking forever, like literally at least a minute to load? And it turns out if you have lots of versions installed that are of like really low level gems that pretty much every other gem depends on, for instance, like RSpec or Rake, that will actually slow down the version picking strategy because it has to map out this whole version tree. And they actually did a pretty good job of optimizing that. And you can actually speed it up by going through and running gem clean or gem prune. I forget, but you can basically uninstall all the older versions that have built up after, you know, running gem update multiple times and actually does speed things up. But also I really dislike about gem sets. And this is a good example of how these features get started and really no one questions them. For instance, like how all these projects are always naming their configuration files something file. And originally that was because Rake named uh, Rake files after Make files. So they're kind of copying Make, kind of like a tongue-in-cheek thing. But then, you know, now we have gem files and uh, guard, was it? File. Proc fi- pro- guard files, proc files. Guard and file. no one really stops them. Like, wait, why are we naming a file file? Um, All in the root directory with no extensions. Your text right. editor loves it. Right, exactly. Yeah. If Josh Susser is listening to this, he's punching the air right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and like the one of the things that's always totally struck me about gem sets, because usually when I need some sort of functionality of isolating gems, it's usually to isolate them to a specific directory so they don't pollute my main gem source. Because let's say, you know, because um, we're, we're so obsessive about test driven developments, I find like something that annoys me in a really big project that's a Pedrino. And I have to pull down all these repos and then I have to run bundle install and I have to make sure like, you know, I have to use bundle install either, uh, you know, tell it to stuff everything in vendor gems and then use bundle exec or I have to somehow isolate the gems. But really like, why do the gem sets have to be in your home dot gem and then have a name? Why not just put the gems in that project directory? Because then when you're done with the project, you just RMRF it and boom, it's done. It's cleaned up. And so that was kind of one thing that annoyed me about this sort of assumption that, like, this is how gem sets have to be implemented. Yeah. So I'll be that guy. Can I be that guy? I was <laughs> going to say, is anyone going to speak I, up for gem sets? I'm, I'm the, not only am I going to speak up for gem sets, but I'm going to speak up for bundler and gem sets together. They're two great tastes that do not taste bad when mixed together. James actually challenged me to give up my gem sets, and he and I worked on a project for a while where... There were like 50 different projects and having gem sets for each one literally meant that like checking out the projects, if you're using gem sets, that's going to take like 1500 hours to build everything and duplicate everything. And I, to- I totally got it. I could totally see it. But when you do a bundle exec, any gems that you have that you like that you use for your development, but do not necessarily go in the project, and they exist if we're developers and we're writing our own tools and we're, we're crafting our own, you know, IRB customizers like, like I do. I have quite a few of these. And if you do a bundle exec, those gems are gone. They are inaccessible to you. I love being able to put gems in my global RVM gem set, and then they don't get pushed up to the project as part of the the gem file. And I can still get to them from IRB when I'm debugging, when I'm developing. I do totally agree with all the issues that have been raised about bundler and gem sets. Uh, like, like when you change out of a directory and the gem set follows you like a lost puppy, that's a bad thing. The thing that I do like about the difference between bundler and gem sets, or specifically between bundle exec and gem sets, is that it seems to me like bundler is a dynamic way of loading your gems and deferring the version managing to the last possible moment, where gem sets is like statically caching them. And I think it was Postmodern that just mentioned a minute ago about why not just bundle the gems into the project yourself And with the exception of size constraints, I think that might actually be an agreeable, you know, workaround solution. Yeah, especially if you're just only working, like, if you're only, like, trying to do a one-line change to a project and then run tests and do a pull request, also, allow me to blow your mind. So, (laughs) gem sets, what they're, all they're doing is changing gem home and also appending something to gem path, which gem path is sort of like path, except it's for directories to look up uh, gems within. 
So you can actually have multiple, you can stack the directories up in GemPath. And so I was actually starting just a you know thought experiment. I was writing a small script that would allow you to basically push and pop directories onto GemPath and then set Gem Home accordingly. And it's still a work in progress, but it's called like Gem underscore Path. And I kind of feel like that would be uh, maybe a tool that people might want to use, or that would be a, a, a philosophy instead of having it like locked into this rigid way of thinking about gem sets where they like have to exist in this directory, they have to be used in this sort of way. We could just expose these variables and have something that would allow us to manipulate however we want, whether if it's wanting yeah. to put a directory on the front of gem path so it takes precedence over everything, or put it on the end so it basically just, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It unions the gems into the existing kind of like gem hierarchy. There is one problem with it because uh, Ruby gems source the gems by version, not by the gem path order. So in mm. Python, in ah. Java, everywhere else, you libraries are sorted by the path you give to the language. And in Ruby, we are exceptional. We have sorting by version. And uh, you cannot say, take gems of my project directory to the front. You cannot say this because the gem with newest version will come up, will be up front. One other little trick for the executables is if you install with Bundler and you use the bin stubs option and then you modify your path so that it looks in dot slash bin first, uh, you can get around some of this. Now, it only then works if you're in the root of your project directory, but most of the time I am when I'm trying to run those executables. Yeah, and every sysadmin right now is listening to this advice to put dot or dot slash bin in the path yeah, and, and they crying. are they are they are vomiting up yeah. their ch do their not CH do mod not do five. that. Yeah, they're setting minus x on everything you own right now. It doesn't yeah, have that, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. I write shell functions for things I commonly do, like RLS to start a Rails server, and I have that function do a couple of things like see if there's a bin directory in the current directory. If there is, and there's Rails in there. Let's do bin Rails server. If there's not, let's do, you know, whatever and, and work our way down. So that's a lot safer than just modifying your path or something. Yeah. And I just want to put a caveat on the dot slash bin thing. I have it on my development machine. I don't put it on the server because that's crazy. And, um, here's, here's, and I really do like the approach of just having being able to just run rake in the root of my project and not. Here's another interesting uh, question. Why are we locking down the versions of basically development CLI utilities? Because uh, that's kind of one of the things I started thinking about was why are we specifying a specific version that always is going to differ from the current version that's installed globally? Why not just put gem rake in the gem file and it'll always use whatever the latest version is? Going back to my point about putting, about having things that I didn't want pushed up into the project, I have probably five to ten different little, little fiddly gems that I use on IRB that are like, do you remember like Herb and Werble, things that would like colorize stuff and, and mm -hmm. make text tables yeah. and that sort of stuff? I've got like awesome print. I think everybody's got awesome print, but I mean, I've got a little thing that I wrote called Vertible. And it's just a gem that I wrote that makes vertical tables. That, that's all it does. It makes text tables, but it, sorts them vertically and nobody else uses this it's i'm the, i'm the only user of this gem i wrote it it works for me and i'm done and i i really needed it to, to debug a project i finally ended up switching to the look -See gem which is awesome if you're not using look -See, you should be but vertible and look -See work a little bit differently and i was i was comfortable pushing look -See up into the development group of the gem file but i was really uncomfortable pushing vertible up because it's like my own private hack gem, and any maintainer taking on the project later is, has got to get the vertible gem and go, what the hell is this? Why is this in my project? So I, I feel compelled to uh, point something out about RVM since we've been kind of harsh on gem sets. You do not have to use gem sets with RVM. I think they're right. on by default, but uh, there is an option to totally shut them off. Just ignore them. So I'll link to that in the show notes, and you can just turn them off if you don't want to use them. So I think that's cool. That makes me happy. So can I bring up another difference that I've run into lately between the systems? Sure. Yeah. 
I used RVM for a long time, and then more recently I've used CHRuby, which I think I usually call Ruby because that's just how I say it. One of the differences I've noticed is how they go about installing, and I guess I should be specific here, uh, CHRuby does not do installing. I use Ruby-install, which is the companion project like Ms. Lab talked about earlier. And the differences in the way they install can be significant. It's my opinion that RVM goes to great lengths to try to install whatever you say, doing however it should do it for your system. So like it has a recipe in its head for how it should install Ruby 2.1.2 on a Mavericks OS 10 system. And it goes through these steps and it makes it happen, including the correct little fiddly bit gotchas that you're bound to run into when you're compiling it by hand and you end up Googling the error message and find out, oh, and Mavericks, they do this, so you have to do this uh, kind of thing. Whereas CHRuby is more minimalist, uh, like Postmodern said. Therefore, it's just, you know, hey, it, it downloads it and compiles it for you. That's what it does. So one of the things that I ran into recently is I was using CHRuby on a, a very recent Ubuntu, I think, Ubuntu 14, before the core team got Ruby set for a difference in read line that was the default on in library line that was the default on that distro. And so I tried to compile Ruby with CHRuby and it just died with a crazy error. And um, I had to do some searching around, just like I would have if I was compiling it by hand. What's this error message mean? Oh, there's a problem with the libreadline version you have. It's already fixed in Ruby trunk, so I had to go find that commit, you know, or commits really, and get the patch. And chruby will let you patch Ruby as it's built. It, it has a switch, or Ruby install, I should be more specific. Ruby install will let you patch Ruby as it's built. It has a switch where you can give the patch and then, you know, have that patch put in and, and it will do it. But I had to do that myself. I had to find that patch, I had to get it there, and I had to add that switch to get it to do that, and then it would build Ruby. And they did fix Ruby very soon after this problem, but I was compiling just right on the edge of the curve, and I ran into that bug. I think those kind of problems are pretty rare in RVM, because somebody runs into them, then they fix RVM to patch it for you and do whatever it needs to do. And when it runs into that system, it just knows what to do to install it, and it does it. So I don't remember having those problems. I, I think I should also bring up the important point that pretty much all of us kind of agree with. Uh, it's important that we fix these problems upstream, and a lot of the times Ruby Core will kind of drag their feet because they have this like complex release engineering process then they uh, push out a new version. And in between that time, we have to then handle all these bugs come, bug reports coming in, like, oh, the Ruby's not compiling. It must be your tool that's broken. And we have to constantly forward people to the upstream bug report. And it would be just nicer if we had a more streamlined process where we can actually fix these problems at the root cause. I'm trying to think of also, was it um, issues with compiling against older uh, OpenSSL, which uh, that was, I think, before Mavericks came out, um, that Apple was shipping this extremely old version, and MRI started requiring a newer one. And so I feel like that if we were able to actually get Apple to upgrade that quicker, it would reduce a lot of the complexity and a lot of the need for these tools to kind of manage these things for you. The problem is uh, asking MRI or any distribution to upgrade something it's it takes time it, like they have this uh, long time support idea for s systems like OS 10 or uh, Ubuntu LTS and they cannot just put something in the system you probably have to use either patch because you are using to new compilation system or you you would have to get a head version of Ruby which is in both ways complicated yeah, I think, I think I agree that, I mean, obviously the ideal thing is, is for the fix to happen upstream because we don't want people to run into it again ever. And that would be great. But, you know, the speed that developers move is exponentially faster than the speed that MRI moves, which is exponentially faster than the speed that Apple moves. Right. I think. 
Well, I, I think a lot of that comes down to the number of use cases you're dealing with, right? I mean, I as a developer run into a specific number of use cases. Ruby has to handle everybody in the Ruby community's use cases. Apple has to handle all of the stuff that's going to run on their platform. And so, yeah, there's a lot to know. I think that this is an interesting topic for me, especially lately, uh, the, the patches and the ability to install Rubies on, on different systems, especially in newer versions of system with newer versions of dependencies such as OpenSSL, LibReadLine, and others. We had a lot of bug reports in Ruby dash build about Ruby's not being able to compile, and especially not the most recent versions, patch releases of Ruby, but the previous ones, like... 2.1.1 uh, or versions like that. And people report to us bugs, and which are almost always bugs with Ruby's incompatibility with system dependencies, and that is fixed upstream. And Ruby-build had this philosophy of no patches. So different from RVM, we had the philosophy of we're not going to apply any patches for you. And that gives you the security of this Ruby version will be unchanged, untweaked, and you are in control completely of the Ruby version and what happens to it. We will just run the compile process for you and that's it. But lately I've been starting to think that we should be backporting some patches like RVM does because our users have a pretty bad experience lately on a variety of systems. On FreeBSD, there's some problems unique to it. On Fedora, there's some problems unique to it. On newer versions of Ubuntu, and then on newer versions of Mac OS. So, because these bugs are user-facing bugs, they are a problem of Ruby. But since people do need to install sometimes older versions of Ruby, and I'm not even speaking 1.8.7 or anything like that. I'm speaking about 1.9.3 or 2.1.1. I would really like to include some patches in Ruby Dash Build in the next iteration of the project because just to reduce the number of bug reports and just to improve people's experience. So in this way, I would I wanted to propose to Sam Stevens and all that he did. I'm waiting for his reply that we kind of quit this philosophy of patch free just because our users are not having a great time lately installing Ruby, installing other versions of Ruby because of this cross-platform differences. And that's, I think, I find that that's okay because priorities change and, and perspectives change. When Ruby built started out, it wanted to be different and it wanted to just handle something in a simple way. But as it grew older and more mature and more adopted and adopted in a more variety of systems, we just realized that user-friendliness and the easiness of install is more important than philosophical correctness, than that following a certain principle. So I'm really hoping that we can iron out some of these issues in the next release. And I'm not sure if Ruby-install applies any patches. Postmortem, do you have any insight of that? The buck stops here. We do not <laughs> apply any patches. You can apply patches yourself if need be, but no. Uh, in the past, we actually did apply one specific patch to get around a weird issue with how one of these scripts generates some C code for, I believe, the DL library for uh, the 1.8 series, uh, 1.8.8, 187. And we eventually then dropped that patch to streamline things because we were applying this, like, third-party patch, and we're not really sure if it's going to continue working in the future. There is other issues with various Ruby versions requiring specific version ranges of GCC. And so basically we just kind of we dropped support for the patch, and I, I kind of incorrectly stated that we dropped support for 187. We're really just removing these kind of hacks to make it easier, uh, and so we're pretty much moving that kind of responsibility onto the user where if you really want to compile a known broken version of Ruby that we have, has to, you know, needs a specific version of OpenSSL, a specific version of GCC, if you really need to have to go back against, kind of going against the flow of developments and use this older version specifically and compile it from scratch, uh, you, you know, you have to set up the environment yourself and specify, you know, what the, uh, you know, the CC environment variable for, you know, which compiler to use and uh, what additional patches to apply. Because, yeah, I'm just a little bit 
it's a little bit nerve wracking to think like, well, we are applying this patch to make it easier and make sure it compiles, but you know, what if it breaks? Whose responsibility? It's suddenly my responsibility because I'm breaking people's rubies. Or it inter- if it introduces some sort of bizarre regression. Yeah, and also I think kind of like we do tend as developers, I've noticed in the Ruby community, we get stuck on versions where if something's already fixed in a previous version, why not upgrade? You know, like uh, check the change log. Probably it's not that significant of upgrade. It's not going to, no new features were introduced. Mislav, I have a question for Mislav. I was thinking about extracting uh, patches to separate uh, repository. Uh, Mislav, we probably should talk about it because uh, RVM already has a lot of these patches and maybe we could use one repository so we don't duplicate the efforts to get something working. And yeah, I think that could be a great idea. Yeah, that is an interesting idea. I was always looking at the patch sets of, of RVM uh the patch sets, I mean, like the just the whole a bunch of patches that are embedded in the project, that are vendored in the project. So I was always a little bit intimidated because I didn't know what most of these were. But I guess some of the patches in the project are, you know, a different importance. Some are performance tweaks, right? And some are patches that are really needed to compile on a certain system. But mm-hmm. I definitely think... I don't want to be reinventing the wheel and figuring out everything from scratch if it's already been figured out. So definitely if there are already ready patches from the RVM project, and I know that some people are pulling patches from the RVM projects to apply to Ruby build because it has the, it has the option, the same as Ruby install, it has the option of um, applying patches on the command line that some people are pulling from the RVM repository. So they either do it from... Ruby's version manager, uh, SVN tracker, and uh, well, not SVN bug tracker, but some of them are pulling them from RVM. So because they're only doing this, I don't see why not. It's just that one reason I would like to have them embedded in our project would just be the technical simplicity of when you pull down, when you get close. Yeah, the, yeah of, of course, of course. Build, I w- w- was thinking about the same for RVM. Better. Yeah, but we should definitely yeah. talk about it because yeah, we I, can use the same repository and just clone it to the inside the project. So it's duplicated, but we can exchange, put new patches in one uh, one code that we can synchronize. Uh, can I only yeah. request that uh, you compile the patches together per version because that's a uh, that make it easier to apply a bundle of patches instead of individually incrementally applying the patch. We can add a tool for that. Yeah. Because that'd be kind of nice. Uh, that's one of the main things I've run into when people are trying to, for instance, apply all the RVM patches. So they're just all these individual patches. And kind of nice if you just had one contiguous compiled patch for like that version. I feel like we just brokered a peace treaty here. <laughs> <laughs> <Awesome. I know. laughs> can, can I ask one more Ruby difference? Diplomacy. One more difference about this, you know, the two different install types. I believe I understand this, but please correct me if I'm wrong. That one of the downsides to the RVM approach, I think, is that basically if I'm using RVM and I want to get, you know, the newly minted Ruby, I need to first update RVM so that it knows the new magic formula for the Ruby installing and then do that. Whereas with Ruby install, I don't update it because it has no idea, you know, one version of Ruby from the other. Actually, RVM does check your version. And if it's older than the available online version, it will give you a warning and you can set a flag to automatically update. Ah, interesting. So then it would... Try to build it just having no special recipe, right? Just using like the default yeah. strategy. Yeah, knowing there is something newer, it, uh, RVM can automatically update and get the newer patches. Mm, interesting. Um, I should also point out that, uh, uh, this law would probably also mention this, but, um, so Ruby build actually has individual recipes per version. And so this allows Ruby build to respond to per version issues, which is kind of nice. But at the same time, most of these versions are basically the exact same recipe. That you, know, you just have to copy it over, uh, do a commit, and then you can update the Ruby build plugin that's usually, I guess, installed uh, directly by cloning Git or install from Homebrew, which you know it's pretty easy to push a new version out to the Homebrew people. Ruby build is a little bit different in the fact that it will take arbitrary versions and just attempt to download the file. 
So, you know, when JRuby 9000 comes out, you can literally type in Ruby build, I mean, Ruby install JRuby 9000. It'll do that. The downside, though, is it, well, currently it does not update the MD5 checksums for all the rubies, and so you kind of have to specify that yourself, which isn't such a big deal because usually when a new version comes out, you learn about that by reading the blog post, which has usually the MD5 checksum right there, and you just copy and paste that to the command line. So I wanted to ask another question. Does the dependency and patching conversation change when the dependencies change? So, for example... With MRI, you're using GCC because it's C. Rubinius is probably G++ because it's C++. You know, if you're uh, JRuby, you're talking about JVM and maybe specific versions of the JVM. Maglev requires Gemstone. Topaz requires uh, Python. Do you have to go through different gymnastics for those, or is it more or less the same process? It depends on the tool. <laughs> In RVM, there is, uh, uh, the actual implementation is like for this much in Ruby, like for every name, we do something different. It's not what was planned for Autolibs, but uh, it was the the only thing that's uh, quite easy to implement in, in the shell. Yeah, it's not like you can resolve the dependencies in shell. You have just access maximally to arrays that the hash arrays are quite limited. So in RVM, you have possibility uh, just uh, in the case of every Ruby do something else. And for every system, a lot of options. Mislav, how is it in Ruby build? Well, it's not as complicated as it thinks. Like, for instance, <laughs> if we're talking about JRuby, um, what I wanted to say, it doesn't have to be as complicated. Like, uh, JRuby, for example, to install it, to download and install it, you don't really need to have a Java development environment or anything like that because you're actually downloading a binary. So the installation process by itself, it's usually simple, but it's the responsibility of the developer for, you know, using non-standard, well, not standard, but non-MRI uh, Ruby implementations is the responsibility of the developer to actually set up their runtime environment for this kind of Ruby implementation. So the Ruby installation process will just handle fetching of this Ruby implementation, but you're still in charge of setting up anything else. Because obviously, we're not going to touch Java on your computer or anything like that for JRuby. So you'll have to handle that yourself. And I'm not a part of from Rubinius. I'm not a big user of alternative Ruby implementations. So I don't have much experience or much to say uh, about the experience with developing with those. But it seems that whoever are the people who are using those, they are seem to be content because we don't get a lot of bug reports or complaints that something is not working. So I think I, I'm, I'm confident that we are, for now, we are solving this problem of obtaining the Ruby versions, the Ruby implementations very well. And we're living up to developer to handle the rest of their development environment. And for now, it's working all right. Um, yeah, so for Ruby install, we basically, our quote-unquote recipes for each kind of implementation, it's separated into basically a script that specifies the individual steps to install that uh, that Ruby so you have like a configure step, you have a clean step, you have a compile, you have an install step, and pretty much those are eventually, there's a calling make uh, with some log messages thrown in there. So it, it pretty much depends on the actual build process and scripts of that Ruby. So if there's a problem there, it's going to crash, you know, it's, they're going to have to report it upstream. But as far as dependencies go, we basically have dependencies uh, sorted out per package manager. So we have like all the dependencies, for instance, for uh, Rubinius, and for we have them for you know apps, uh, yum, ports, Mac ports, uh, brew, and Pacman, which is the uh, Arch Linux uh, package manager. And so we just list out all the all the build and runtime dependencies that are uh, necessary. I'm kind of considering splitting those apart, uh, so you can basically only install the runtime uh, as opposed to the build. 
And for instance, one of the gotchas for JRuby, uh, we do install uh, JDK, but that is only for apt, yum, and Pac-Man. Homebrew, uh, they actually don't, for copyright reasons, uh, they don't include that. So basically, we just print a message saying, go to this URL and download it. We have had some issues where people wanted very configurized and customized environments. For instance, they wanted JRuby, but they didn't want to have X11 installed on their server. They wanted a headless JRuby environment. That meant they couldn't use all the GUI toolkits that are included with the JDK. So that was kind of an issue. Uh, we also had issues, for instance, uh, people complained about, because Rabinius' build system is implemented in Ruby, this gives them a lot of power and flexibility in detecting things on the system and... You know, they can do a lot more than using autoconf and libtool and automake uh, and like, you know, a bunch of bash scripts. But the downside of that is basically it makes, makes MRI a build dependency of Rubinius. And so some people vehemently wanted to build Rubinius, but they didn't want the Ruby package from the package manager installed in their system which, you know, they could have gone afterwards and just uninstalled. So kind of had to, like, draw the line there and basically saying, well, it's a build dependency of Rubinius. If you have specific needs, you can always build it by hand. There's compilation instructions on the website. You can literally just copy and paste. And, yeah, that kind of generates some, uh, you know, some hurt feelings. Some people got really angry about that. But, you know, that's kind of the philosophy of Ruby install is that you run it on an actual system and you don't have to do anything else. It handles the dependencies, it downloads the files, does all that. Uh, There's no user interaction unless there's, like, bugs and stuff like that, of course. Or password. Yeah, yeah, you know, at least enter in, uh, you know, run it under sudo or something like that if you want to install it globally as roots or you run the package managers to install packages. The other gotcha is because Homebrew installs everything into USR local and Sims Links uh, libraries back into like the Homebrew, I think they're called kegs or something, I forget what they're called, in the seller, I think that's what they call it. The autoconf configure scripts do not check user local by default, and so we actually have to add all this code that specifically passes in all the paths from Homebrew, just for Homebrew, so we have like specific logic just for them, and also Mac ports, uh, to pass in the directory to check for all the libraries. And so when you, when you install Ruby with Ruby install, it will actually compile against the Homebrew libraries as opposed to your system libraries. Mm. There are some edge cases, uh, like on Raspberry Pi, the clock gets uh, shift time shifted, like you get it off after uh, getting it to sleep or shooting it out, uh, down. So RVM automatically installs NTP for you and sets it up because after unpacking Ruby, the time is in future. So you cannot build and uh, there are problems with the build uh, or when you work on OS X. Uh, and uh, the OpenSSL package is not native package from uh, Apple. So uh, your uh, security certificates for downloading anything from internet are either old or even not existent. So RVM automatically syncs them from the Apple uh, certificate store. So there is always something more to do. And I think that the problem is finding a line. Where is it good to do it all? And sometimes you don't have to do everything. But if you miss these steps, you use, uh, you leave your users vulnerable because most of them doesn't know about the lack of certificates in uh, OS X for uh, OpenSSL. Right, and that's that's another, you know, OSX related issue. And so we probably need to work better on fixing that at the root cause. Uh, I think Apple is at the verge of dropping open, uh, OpenSSL at all. I'm not sure if they shipped it in the last release of their system, but uh, they don't want to have it. Maybe they'll switch to Libra OS SSL. Troll, lol, lol, lol. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually want to throw in a question here. Uh, so what do you guys think about this kind of an ongoing push? I mean, you know, the thing we've been trying to do is get more Ruby implementations to publish actual packages so people don't have to deal with compiling things versus with Clang or GCC or, you know, the, the past troubles, you know, having to install Xcode and all that stuff where we can just download a pre-compiled trusted binary and install that. I believe uh, Rubinius is moving towards creating a bunch of pre-compiled binaries and packages. So, you know, you can basically just add some sort of repository, install some sort of RPM or dev, or just extract a targz. 
and uh, the kind of the last man standing who hasn't who doesn't basically uh, provide uh, binary packages is is MRI Ruby Core. I have a ticket for them for it. Yeah, we've been trying to convince them, but it kind of seems like a human resource problem where they're hesitant to take on the challenge and the responsibility of distributing precompiled binaries. And like, you know, what if they break? But even though there's the was it the RVM build scripts that automatically will spit out precompiled binaries, there is also recently I saw a person. We'll have to add the URL in the uh, show notes later. But who's uh, basically set up a build process for creating precompiled binaries for RV RBM? That uh, install into basically you extract them. They're like targzs into your dot rbm versions directory, if I if I remember correctly. Travis shares number of binaries for different versions, but only for the Ubuntu version they use. Yeah, I like the concept of pre-compiled binaries. I don't think that Ruby core team needs to maintain those. And I don't even think that any Ruby implementers, I mean, unless they really want to, uh, alternative Ruby implementations, they can maintain the binaries. But if they don't want to, I think it should be the community's responsibility to make those pre-compiled binaries, just as it's community's responsibility to make packages for this different Linux distributions, right? I like that now pre-compiled binaries for Ruby are possible, trivially. So we've been looking lately, there are open pull requests and issues on Ruby Builds issue tracker that we do the support for downloading pre-compiled binaries if they're available, if not uh, compile it for your current system. So I guess we are following in the track of uh, what RVM supports right now. And since... I would say, you know, 80% of Ruby developers use just a tiny subset of systems. I think that with only a handful of pre-compiled binaries, we can really go a long way to improving user experience with installing all these Ruby versions and with the stability of the installation process and with the speed. I think the greatest benefit will be speed. So that's something we're looking into right now. Yeah, so I also mentioned that uh, a lot of people uh, use the FPM Ruby gem, which uh, can generate a variety of different packages, devs, RPMs, uh, you kind of name it. Uh, I believe it actually can spit out EXEs even. I'm not sure. All right, might be thinking of another one. But yeah, and so it is possible to actually roll your own packages to basically use Ruby build or Ruby install, install into an arbitrary directory, and then package that up. And you now, boom, have a nice precompiled package you can drop onto uh, servers. I just want to, you know, be, uh, you know, wave my finger as someone who works in uh, security. Uh, if you are producing binary packages, we definitely want to be able to verify that, you know, malware hasn't been injected into them or, you know, I'm going to install Ruby and all of a sudden I'm going to be start spamming out Viagra ads when I, you know, run IRB. And so there's a whole kind of... I can totally see that. Right? I know. <laughs> IRB. That gives me an idea for a new gem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there's a whole thing called deterministic builds, and the Tor project, I think, was the first ones uh, to start touting this as something that was necessary, where you actually have a build process that you can reproduce the binary and prove that byte for byte, you know, nothing was changed. And so there's actually a tool for this called Gideon. It's a Git, E-N, G-I-T-I-A-N. And it actually uses, uh, it's distributed as a Ruby gem, which is kind of interesting, but it, it allows you to basically create a deterministic uh, build script, and then you can verify that, and they have an example uh, for building Bitcoin as a deterministic uh, build. And so that's kind of an interesting thing, and it kind of, you know, hopefully, maybe we could explore this, maybe more people could, uh, you know, try using it, or at least you know, submit feedback on it. Isn't that a bit over-engineered, though? Isn't it enough to verify that a download hasn't tampered with by just checking the checksum, like MD5 or as Ruby built recently switched to SHA checksums. But how do we know that your system isn't compromised or your compiler isn't compromised? So you basically need like a completely other system that's independent to verify. I'd really love to see a blog post or something on this because I, I love the idea of binaries you know, just pull down a binary that works instead of making me wait until it compiles or whatever. 
So it was mentioned the Raspberry Pi earlier, and I think compiling Ruby on my Raspberry Pi takes around three hours and change. It's pretty close to four hours, I think. So, yeah, a binary is a big deal then, right? <laughs> so I'm reminded that every time you gem installs a gem that you don't know anything about, you're executing somebody else's code on your system. Yep. But in case of gems, you can go and see the code. You can even uh, fetch the gem and manually install it from the uh, binary you fetch. But in case of Ruby, you get a executable that's uh, compiled code. You would have to be able to read the machine code for your system. And plus, binaries are usually stripped, and so you're actually, you know, and also optimized. So you, it's it's a lot difficult to actually audit them, at least for a layman, you know, like us. I know this great story about Heroku getting hacked. This was years ago. I guess three years ago or four years ago. The way that got, like, their whole infrastructure got compromised is that somebody wrote a gem and published it on Ruby Gems. That as a part of its installation process, it opens an SSH tunnel back to the attacker's machine. So the gem install will hold indefinitely and it will last a really long while. And during this time, the attacker had an SSH access to uh, unlimited ASS, SSH access to Heroku's infrastructure, and they kind of broke out of just one isolated environment and got access to other environments as well. And it was pretty nasty, and they were really quick to patch it up. And I don't know how much of this was published or, you know, they were, if they were official post-mortem, but I was talking to some Heroku engineers and I just thought that was a genius way to hack into somebody's infrastructure by making a gem like that. So I'm always amazed by the resourcefulness of hackers and the way they can think outside of the box. That's a sobering story. Yeah, no kidding, right? It makes me appreciate how hard what the three of you are all working on really is. Like, I mean... So many different environments, so many different combinations, so many different versions of Ruby and implementations. I think one of the things we should probably do is just thank you all for your effort because you make yes. all, all of our lives considerably easier every day and we don't have to read the messages reporting all the problems that you do. <laughs> and I'm sure it's amazing. Oh yeah, I'd also like to add on to that. I think I speak for everyone, the, the round table here, that bash and shell scripting is like the worst programming paradigm ever. <laughs> yes, yes, it's yes. really bad. The worst. I'm not sure if the worst, but it's really bad. It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all the caveats and edge cases. That's what really gets you. Uh, Avdi, you, you write you... something in shell. Avdi, you write web apps in bash now, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, cool. Is that the new thing? Are we are we already moving <laughs> off Go? <laughs> Bash on bales? I don't know. <laughs> no, it, please. So there's actually something very similar to that. That's a real thing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, oh. it has a slightly rude name. So the the COBOL on Cog's website is still up. <laughs> I'm a I'm more of a fan of Fortran on fails. Ah, uh, there you go. So. Have we more or less wound down? Is there anything else we need to know that we just didn't think or know to ask? I have a question for all of us, and we can take turns answering it, as I would ask what's next for each of these projects. So what's next on the roadmap for RVM? I can answer what's next in the roadmap for R RBM. And I guess CH Ruby is kind of like the way it is right now. It minimalist. I don't see it undergoing radical changes, but that might not be true. So I'm interested in uh, each of these maintainers telling their story. So I would like to start with RVM. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So RVM has this big plan for RVM2, which, uh, because I hate shell, will be written in Ruby. And I've started working on it. I have moved parts of RVM1 to Ruby already. And uh, there, there is few ge few gems. Some are even used in in other uh, Ruby switchers, like uh, what was it, uh, uh, Ruby Gems Bundler gem, which automatically does uh, bundle exec for you. Because I I really had problems with users. Hey, I'm uh, my race doesn't work, and the error. You are using some wrong versions of version of gem. So I've wrote this uh, 
Ruby James Bundler, which is code in Ruby, which is Agile. So, uh, which will load, uh, proper, uh, will, will set up bundle setup for you instead of asking you to run bundle exec. So it might be a bit slower in some occasions, but uh, I got like, I don't know, three or four people that were really wanting, that didn't want to use it. And otherwise I, I'm really happy I wrote it because now I don't have to answer all these questions where these versions don't match. Everything just works. And I'm, I'm moving parts of RVM code that does work after. So I'm stuck. I'm moving code to gems now. Everything that's. Uh, run after Ruby is installed because RVM depends on shell. We don't have Ruby dependence. I cannot move everything at once to, to Ruby, but everything that's run after Ruby is installed, I'm moving to gems and there are a few gems in, uh, uh, GitHub slash RVM. And uh, after I move everything what's possible for RVM one to gems, I will be uh, moving all the code base to Ruby. Uh, with uh, changing the scope a bit and may, mm, changing is not enough to say uh, I will extend the scope so it will be no more just installing Ruby because Ruby has dependencies like Java uh, for JRuby and I was having the talk with JRuby maintainers Tom and Charlie uh, this Eurocamp and they want to uh, install JRuby 9000 with RVM, but you need some special sort of Java, which implements, uh, I don't remember the new feature, but there is a new feature, which is right now in beta, beta release. So you need to install this version of Java to make this new JRuby work. And this is quite problematic to make sure everything is properly installed. So RVM2 will no more be just for Ruby, it will install everything. And as for version switching, I'm thinking about borrowing parts of the ideas of CHRuby, uh, because yeah, that's the small, the minimalistic switcher that's really, I like this idea, but maybe I will go maybe so somewhere between RBN and CHRuby where you will get really small switcher, but with some possibilities of extending, I'm still thinking about the ideas for making it really work, but yeah, that's the plan to separate everything, to have a, a lots of gems so you can get uh, a gem file in which you can specify. I want to install Rubies, Javas and whatever, and it will be automatically done. The rest will be automatically done for you. All right. Thank you. I'll go on, continue on saying about the projects I'm maintaining. So RBN, I have a plan for it. I already did some code to um, speed it up a lot since compared to other projects on the runtime, it's typically slower because of the overhead. That could be 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, to which most people don't notice, but people who are really fast typists and who are <laughs> optimize their environment really well to run really quickly, they do notice this kind of overhead and lag on every invocation of uh, Ruby executables. So definitely want to speed this up. And general user friendliness, like a rehashing of the shim executables after you install gems without any plugin needed, um, things like that. So generally just making it more snappy, more user friendly, but uh, no big changes in functionality because functionality is already there and the project already does what it needs to do. As for Ruby build, both plans that I have is doing the patches so that people have a better user experience of installing on different environments and the binaries as well, which we talked to length about. And that's kind of the short roadmap for this, these projects. Generally, I would keep them the way they are right now, stable. I just want for people to have a better experience using them, like they, that they feel, start to feel more secure in the way that they can just continue on doing their work and things will just rubies their ruby environment will just work for them and they wouldn't have to google for error messages and things like that because that's one of the worst things about setting up your ruby development environment it's all the complex it doesn't need to be any more complex yeah so uh even though that 
you know, Sea of Truvia is pretty minimal and small. There's a couple of remaining things that we've been meaning to do. Development goes pretty slowly on it. One of which is adding natural uh, version sorting of the actual rubies array. And so we can actually, one of the problems, because Bash naturally, uh, I mean, not naturally, but Bash automatically sorts things lexicographically. And so, for instance, if you have a path that ends in, you know, 1, 2, 10, that's going to come before 1, 2, 1. And so we need to actually sort, sort these by versions. And one of the developers who also works on Sea of Truby, uh, Havenwood, Havenwood, uh, he wrote this, perfected this massive giant stri- bash string that basically sorts the actual paths by version. And so we actually need, like, he did a bunch of cross-platform testing, and we just basically need to do some benchmarking, and that will probably go in the next 040 uh, release. And let's see, there's a couple other things we wanted to add to it. A- adding extra functions. Um, there's also a, a split-off project that basically wraps around CHRuby, and it's a uh, provides like a fish wrapper, so you can use it in the fish shell because the fish shell is not POSIX compliant, so all your bash scripts and ZHS scripts will not work, and so they have to either port them directly across or write wrappers, and so he wrote a wrapper that basically just runs bash underneath and then gets the appropriate information back and then loads that to the fish shell. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, as for Ruby install, one of the things I've been kind of thinking about but hesitant because it's going to lock me in uh, is automatically update the known stable version families and also updating MD5 checksum lists. Uh, so, you know, when a new version comes out, you can just you know run an update script and it'll pull down the new files for those. And so you'll automatically... How do you mean, what? How do you mean it will lock you in? Uh, well, it locks me into a format. I have to support a format and a URL, so I can't move them. I have to simulate ah. them. And, yeah, so I've been kind of wanting to change, like, the format, for instance, how we list stable versions, and instead of actually, like, having them grouped by version family, just do fuzzy sorting, I mean, fuzzy matching on them. So you could just, like, you know, it'll just pick the largest or highest version of 1.9 if you select to install 1.9. Yeah, and Etsy, there's also, we have support for binary builds in there. We just haven't released it because there's really kind of un, uneven supports. You know, everyone has their own kind of binaries, and that's kind of a uh, you know weird thing, and we have to sort that all out. Also, when I have some actual free time to actually work on code, I want to wrap up this uh, gem path helper and kind of release that. Because I had another utility called CH Gems that kind of did a weird kind of like CH root for uh, Ruby Gems, but there was issues with CH Ruby because Tmux users required that we did more kind of aggressive automatic version switching, and that kind of broke some of the the, the features when you use it in conjunction with CH Gems. And so I kind of want to move to um, the Gem Path utility, which will just be loaded in your shell and will not spawn a subshell. So that's that's pretty much it. Pretty stable, and I kind of think also I'm like watching how things are kind of evolving. Uh, there's a huge push in the Linux community to move towards Linux containers and Docker. Even this new roadmap for the Fedora Linux distribution, they have this big kind of castle in the sky plan called Fedora Workstation. It's pretty much going to be applications will be distributed as Docker images that will run in like self-contained environments and then communicate with the system through like Unix pipes or like Dbus, something like that. Or no, I think they're actually using the KDbus, which is like integrated in the kernel. But yeah, it's something else. So that's, I think, uh, it for me. Awesome. You know, if people want to find out more about these uh, different options, what are the best ways to do that? probably just say read the wiki pages i mean the readmes all the readmes for these projects are incredibly detailed there'll be urls in the show notes i'm pretty sure uh they're all, rvm just also has a nice wiki yeah they're all on github all right yeah we'll put links to all that in the show notes then i think there's there's an interesting correlation just real quick for you guys can rebut me if i'm wrong but i think there's a good correlation with hicks law and with uh lever's law Hicks law basically talks about the complexity of a thing versus the efficiency of it. And Lever's law is a law that I made up and named after my friend Don Lever, who once said, everything the system does for you, the system also does to you. And I noticed that people who like, you know, CH Ruby also like mini test and they also like small, sharp 
things. And people who like RVM t- tend to like RSpec and tend to like Cucumber and they tend to like, you know, I want the system to do everything for me. And I think it's really interesting that there's, there's that commonality. And I find it fascinating when I find somebody who loves one complicated, luxurious tool and also loves one small, sharp, fast, deadly tool. That's a nice uh, little hypothesis there. It'd be a shame if uh, someone would provide a counterexample. I don't um, think that's <laughs> categories. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, I okay. I love uh, RSpec, and I'm actually in the process of converting. I, I kind of like settled on these like sets of tools, and so I've been using RSpec forever. Hang on, I'm tweeting something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to push us into the picks. James, do you want to go first? Sure. I'll just do two really quick. This first one I noticed just before we got on the call, and it's basically an analysis of the most popular Ruby standard libraries by usage. And it was pretty interesting. First of all, the the list of 30 they give are probably something you should be familiar with. I'm pretty sure I've used all of them, uh, save maybe one. And you probably should know these, but also they kind of explain their process of how they came up with these numbers and what they thought about that. And it was pretty interesting. So uh, it's a fun read if you're into this kind of stuff. And my second pick is this, uh, since we've been talking a lot about system administration stuff, and I'm kind of a system administration dummy, there's this system administration screencast that covers lots of cool utilities and kind of made me think of some of the stuff we talked about with uh, Julie Evans recently about, you know, understanding how things are working at the lower level, and I found that interesting. So if you would like to see some cool system administration stuff, uh, you might enjoy these sets of screencasts. That's it for me. Okay. Avdi, what are your picks? As I've mentioned several times on the show, I recently went to the Midwest I.O. conference uh, in Kansas City, which is a very cool uh, sort of multidisciplinary, multilingual conference. And the opening keynote was really cool, uh, really worth watching, very inspiring. Uh, Dr. Jeff Norris talked about mission-critical innovation and talked about his experiences running Mars missions or you know, running the team that writes software for Mars missions. Fun fact about writing software for Mar- Mars missions, they keep writing the software basically right up until the point that the, uh, the lander lands on Mars because they can keep sending software updates to it. But he also had some very, uh, very interesting presentation software, which I'm not even going to try to describe. But anyway, the video is up on YouTube and totally worth watching. I'll put a link in the show notes. On a less technical note, got myself some new glasses recently. And after a tip from a friend of mine, I went to Warby Parker, which is an online store or mostly online store that basically they just sell uh, really high quality like designer glasses that they've designed uh, for a relatively reasonable price. They're like 95 bucks. Which, you know, if you look at the like full price that on the glasses at your local glasses store is probably a pretty good deal. And you just send them your prescription and they send you glasses. Or you can, I think you can also do a thing where you like, they send you a bunch of different frames without glasses in them so you can try them on and then, you know, figure out which one you like. I've been wearing them for a while now and they worked out really well. One more pick. I cannot believe I haven't picked this before, but I was looking through the picks and I can't find it, so I will pick the show Pingu. Uh, If you have Netflix and you have kids and you are not watching Pingu with them already, I mean, well, okay, young kids, you totally should be. It is this the most, like, it's the most adorable kid show ever. It is Claymation. It stars uh, a bunch of Claymation penguins that speak in a made-up gibberish language, and it's precious, and it's, like, inoffensive to adult sensibilities, I'll say. It's one of those shows that, that I can sit around and watch with the kids and not just get mad because it's so lame and badly done. So, yeah, really cool show. And I think that'll be it for now. All right. Um, I'll jump in with a couple of picks. Um, I'm going to pick three books. They're all really short on Audible. They're an hour and a half or less, and they are kind of these self-helpish... I hate using that term because... But anyway, I found them really inspiring, so I'm going to share them. Uh, the first one is called Rhinoceros Success, and basically it's about focus. And so it provides a metaphor. You are like a rhinoceros, so you choose something to focus on and charge toward it until you run it down, basically. He does take the metaphor a little further than I thought was necessary, but I thought overall the message was really good, and it really did inspire me to get up and, and really focus on the one thing that I want to charge down. 
The next one is called The Go-Getter, and it is more of a parable story. I mean, it's an example story, and it demonstrates what a go-getter is and talks about what it really means to be a go-getter. And I really, again, found it inspiring. Both books are really short. The last one is called QBQ, The Question Behind the Question, and it's a lot about personal responsibility. And the crux of the book is basically, instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Or why is this happening? The question behind the question is, what can I do about it? Because if you are asking whose fault it is, or asking why something is happening, you're not really getting to anything constructive, because you're not asking, what can I do to fix it? And so it kind of trains you to ask the questions that are going to lead you to a solution or at least lead you to a constructive way of dealing with it. So instead of passing blame, you know, you take personal responsibility and, uh, you know, if it's not your fault, you still have some responsibility in the way that you react or respond. And so instead of why is this my fault is how can I make the situation better? You know, how can I uh, encourage, you know, some other person to do something, though that isn't as uh, constructive because obviously it depends on somebody else. But anyway, it really, really helped me go, okay, so even if it's not my fault or even if I you know, don't want to accept that it's my fault, I can still ask the question, how do I make this better? How do I keep it from happening again? Anyway, great books. They're all real short. I put links to in Amazon and Audible because I listen to them and uh, they're terrific. So those are my picks. David, what are your picks? I've got three today. Uh, the first one, real quick, for Linux users. Uh, there's a program called RSI Break, which it's not an elegant program. I'm going to, I'm going to throw, I'm going to lead with the bad. It's not a pretty program, but it's Linux. What do you expect, right? And if you can get past the, the poor aesthetics, it's a fantastic program for what it does. And that is, is that it, it just sits up in your little taskbar up in GNOME or in KDE and you tell it how long you need between rest intervals to like stretch your wrists or stretch your fingers or, or get up and walk around or, you know, whatever, just get away from the computer for a few seconds, you look away from the screen and look off and, you know, focus your eyes far away. And you can program it to just give you a little notification, you know, for 10 seconds every, every five minutes or you can, I, I actually tried setting it up to do Pomodoros as well to give me a five minute break every 25 minutes. And the cool thing about it is that it will lock your screen. It will lock your desktop if you tell it to. And so you're typing along and this little thing that says, please take a break for 500 seconds or 300, whatever, whatever five minutes is 300 seconds, 299, 298, 297. And then I'm still trying to finish this document, right? So I'm typing, typing. And so it keeps resetting. Please take a break for 300 seconds. Type, type, type. Please take a break for 300 seconds. And then after about 15 seconds, and, and it gives you a button to say postpone, you know, you, you can disarm the bomb. But after about 15 seconds, boom, your screen locks and it just says, please take a break for 300 seconds. And there's a button that you can click to unlock it and make it go away. But if you let it drive you, if you say, yeah, you know what? I really do need to stand up and and stretch my legs or stretch my wrists or whatever. It's exactly what you need to get yourself away from the keyboard and get yourself stretching and resting the way you need to. So that's my first pick. I want my Uh, computer screen to lock and tell me to go for a walk. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... (laughs) <laughs> so my second pick is I, I've had this Bluetooth theme, I guess. Uh, I guess the not really a theme. I picked a Bluetooth thing last week, but the week before that, I was griping endlessly in the pre-show about Bluetooth. So it doesn't really count as a theme to to the listeners. But uh, this is, is going to conclude my theme, which is I have finally found a Bluetooth headset that I love, and that is the Jaybird Blue Buds X. They make a just a headphones Bluetooth headphones version. That's the, these are it, this is a really premium. I want to say it's about one hundred and fifty dollars for the headset, and the headphones are about a hundred. They're not cheap, but they deliver fantastic sound. They wrote their own codec for Bluetooth. They use just has superb audio. They've they've got their own signal booster in the headset so that you can put them on and then no matter where you put your iPod you can put them you know in your pants pocket on the other side of your body whatever the the signal connectivity is still good you can get 20 20 feet away from the transmitter with these things and they still get really strong signal they, and without skipping they're really really good and the reason I like them is that they are the first in the ear earbud that I can stand and the reason I can stand them is they have this little silicone 
kind of a Spock ear sticking up off of the top of the earbud. So you plug the thing into your ear like an earplug, and then I'm not sure what the scientific name for this is, but you tuck the little pointy uppy thing into the the I think the technical term is the creasy foldy ovary part of the front of your ear inside the <laughs> shell. So you tuck the the pointy bit into the creasy foldy ovary bit of your ear and it holds the earbuds in place without you having to hammer them into your ear canal and fracture your skull in the process. And so these things are designed to stay in while you are playing soccer, okay? And playing like like rough sports where you get knocked down. And they do. They fit great and they feel fantastic and they they give really great audio. The headset works fantastic with my Android phone and I love it. So my last pick is My Cat from Hell, which is basically the dog whisperer only for cats. We, we've all heard crazy cat stories and basically this is a, a, a semi-reality show about crazy cats and crazy cat people. And the bottom line is this guy comes out and basically if you don't like cats, you don't understand them. And this guy comes out and he retrains people to understand how they're treating their cat is what's causing their behavior problems. Everything from peeing in the sink to attacking you while you are asleep, you know, like running up into the bed and biting you. And he gets these cats to mellow out and calm down and not be crazy. And at the end of the show, everybody loves their cat and it's wonderful. And it's an amazing show because the cats start out completely bat poop insane and they end up cuddly, fuzzy, wonderful, snuggly kitties at the end. And it's all about how the humans put energy into the cats and how the cats then respond to it. So them's my picks. All right, Michael, what are your picks? Uh, my first pick will be OpenZUSA. It's my Linux distribution I use, and I'm really happy with it. And for all the Rubyists out there, the management utility for OpenZUSA is uh, written in Ruby. So if you get any issues or ideas, you want to improve it, you can jump in and use your Ruby to work on it. My second pick will be JRuby. I used to be Java developer for some time and I hated Java. And because I hated Java, I had a really hard time in believing in JRuby, in what they want to do and how it does. And I finally, finally understand the difference between JVM and Java. And uh, for everybody afraid of Java, you should not be afraid of JRuby. JVM is a really fast engine to run Ruby, and you should try it. And my last pick is uh, swimming. I love to swim in lake, and I like it to the point where when my kids have uh, issues with uh, sleeping, I ask them to, to close their eyes and think of swimming, like imagine you're swimming. And most of the time it works. All right, Mislav, what are your picks? Well, it's hard to pick anything after searching on the Ruby Rogues picks page because everything in the world oh, has been picked <laughs> already. Oh, uh, just, um, pick, uh, just pick Sandy Metz's book then and you're golden. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to pick, I will repick Bash Shell from three years ago. I think Chuck picked it first uh, in a podcast three years ago. I will repick it now because... It's relevant, all programmed here in Bash, and we all trash talked about it and, you know, are frustrated with it, but it's really therapeutic to write all these tiny shell scripts for your development environment. And at, at least if you're working like most of us are in a Unixy environment that can run executables. <laughs> And Bash is pretty much guaranteed to run everywhere. It doesn't have dependencies. And it is this horrible language, which is kind of hard to grok. But there's certain parts of it that I really like. It's maybe like JavaScript. It's this Stockholm syndrome that you're working in this horrible language that is so basic that it doesn't handle most of the things you need handled. But when you finally get through it and you make a working thing, you feel really proud of yourself. So that's, I think, what's an appeal of Bash programmers and JavaScript programmers yeah, that yeah. we can share. And since RBN is written entirely in Bash, I've, by contributing to this project, I thought I had to teach myself Bash, and I'm very grateful for it, uh, for this knowledge. So you can go 
up on my dot files, missile slash dot files on GitHub to see all the tiny little bash executables that I created for my developing with Ruby and other things and mostly Git actually in my development environment. And bash is the first pick. The second pick would be British Columbia, Canada in the summer. I'm currently backpacking around here. I won't stay much longer. I'm going down to the US, but it's a fascinating place to be traveling and I recommend everybody to at least take one summer and a few weeks or more to visit British Columbia because it's really great. And those are two of my picks. All right. Postmodern, what are your picks? Adding on the, uh, on Miss Law's, uh, bash thing, uh, two resources I totally found that were invaluable to dealing with all the caveats and the edge cases and the gotchas of bash, uh, programming <laughs> is, uh, Woolage. So Woolage is a Wikipedia page that has like all the pretty much the pro bash pro tips. And if you go into the bash IRC channel on Freenode, they're basically just going to link you to there and tell you to RTFM. Uh, the other thing is Shunit2, S unit. Uh, testing framework. Uh, it's pretty much available in your package manager already. It's super easy. If you're not testing your Bash script already, you need to do that now because there's just so many things that can go wrong in a Bash script because it depends so heavily, coupled so heavily to environment variables and weird issues like that. Um, as for audio, notice my amazing voice. What I'm using oh, yeah. is the the Blue Microphone Nessie. So uh, Blue Microphones have been picked twice in the past on Ruby Rogues, nice. but the Nessie is the latest one, and it's basically meant to be plug-and-play for uh, amateur podcasters and musicians. There's a weird switch in the back that automatically enables a whole bunch of uh, filters, whether you're recording voice or audio. And it literally was, it's, it's recently priced also. It's not a high-end microphone, but it sounds pretty high-end. And it's USB, you just plug it in, go. I didn't have to do anything on Linux, it just worked. Uh, then also for headphones, a lot of people kind of get into this whole, uh, you know, status symbol of like their office equipment. They have the thousand dollar glass desk and, you know, the, uh, the ergonomically designed chair. And especially, you know, the, the super high end expensive Sony headphones or Seinhauser headphones. But there's actually a headphone company you probably haven't heard of, uh, unless you're like a, you know, weird audiophile who, you know, only streams their music over cables made of pure diamond. Um, but it's actually uh, a reasonably priced uh, headphone company that is actually made in the U.S. I didn't know that. It's called Grado Labs. And even their lowest end headphone sounds amazing. I was using them for the longest time. I believe it was the SR20s or the SR30s. And they, the cord eventually broke because I was yanking on the cord too much and it kind of frayed or the connection, the headphone, because I kept dropping them. And I had to go back to normal headphones, and you could definitely tell the difference. I mean, it's literally like going between FM and AM. There's definitely a noise. You lose quality. And so that definitely improved my, like, audio listening enjoyments. It also helps that, you know, you haven't blown out your eardrums from years of, like, going to rock, you know, heavy metal concerts and standing right next to the speakers. So this was picked uh, previously in the past, but I think it deserves reiterating because it's changed a lot. Is all right. So in this age of all this gnashing of teeth about Rails, and you know, is Rails omakase or whatever, or is TDD dead? I have had a whole bunch of enjoyment recently by building APIs and web services on top of Padrino, and Padrino has actually improved massively in the recent uh, like year. And one of the great things about it is just the fact that it's, it's familiar because it's built on top of Sinatra and it pulls a lot of the Sinatra isms in. But also the fact that when you submit feature requests to them, be like, hey, it'd be great if you could filter the requests coming in based on what parameters are have been parsed. And that way you can actually use it to kill mass injection vulnerabilities at the router level. So before it even gets to a controller, it could just kill it. And they actually accept your feature requests and they try to implement them. And they're like, hey, that's a great idea. Instead of like, no, go away. And that's been that's been a whole lot of fun. So try something else. If if Rails isn't working for you, there are other options. And lastly, something that's massively improved my productivity is using an alternative window manager. And so kind of the whole ideas or desktop environment, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, on on, on Unix and Linux systems, we've had this whole abundance of all these various window managers. There's zillions of tiling window managers where all the windows are just tiled congruently onto the screen. 
um, probably because they're so easy to write. There's there's like tons, but I use a normal. I think you would call it Mosaic window manager, and so I, I'm still on Fluxbox, which is a really old one. But it ha- one of the benefits is it has amazing configuration and amazing key bindings. So you, basically, I have key bindings for switching between different types of windows. I have all the different types of windows, my my terminals, uh, text editors, chat windows. All of them are pre-configured to pop up in certain parts of the screen. And I have key binds to spawn uh, new text editors or new uh, browsers or terminals, as well as switch in between them. Key binds for moving them diff- between different workspaces. Pretty much, I barely use the mouse anymore. And also, there's no animations, which I have also found made a huge like cognitive performance boost because you aren't sitting there mentally waiting for the animation to finish. It just you hit a key and boom, there it is. So those are those are my tips or picks. Sorry. Awesome. Well, I have no time. I've got to run, so we'll wrap it up. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Yeah, we'll catch you all next week. Thank you. A special thanks to HoneyBadger.io for sponsoring Ruby Rogues. They do exception monitoring, uptime, and performance metrics, and are an active part of the Ruby community. Working and learn from designers at Amazon and Quora, developers at SoundCloud and Heroku, and entrepreneurs like Patrick Ambron from Brand Yourself. You can level up your design, dev, and promotion skills at Level Up Con, taking place October 8th and 9th in downtown Saratoga Springs, New York. Only two hours by train from New York City, this is the perfect place to enjoy early fall at Oktoberfest while you mingle with industry pioneers in a resort town in upstate New York. Get your ticket today at levelupcon.com. Space is extremely limited for this premium conference experience. Don't delay. Check out levelupcon.com now. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the Rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlay.